The Man in Line with Andy Wint. Pastor Mike, good afternoon. We're open line today through till one. Text one double six one double seven. WhatsApp one double six one double seven. Email studio at magtradio.com. Call sixty six thirteen sixty eight. Tomorrow it's uh, going to be all about the wind farms as uh, Manx Utilities and Wardell Armstrong will be on. Lizzie Riley from Manx Utilities and Paul Evans and Ian Ramsbottom from Wardell Armstrong, the consultants. Uh, but today we're open line, so anything on your mind, anything you want to say. Thank you, Ray, who dropped me a note in to say, has the Queen died? Yes, she did. However, he explains, I've just got my new passport. Inside the front cover, it says, Her Britannic Majesty's Lieutenant Governor of the Isle of Man, etc., etc., etc. Now, the Queen died in September 2022. Does that make the passport invalid as it was issued on the 30th of January this year? Maybe they're just using old stock. Maybe they're being very sustainable and using old stock. However, it does beg the question, doesn't it? Her Britannic Majesties, etc., etc. Thanks also uh, to John, who uh, dropped me a note uh, on uh, the report on sustainability and green energy compiled by the Alaman government, listing potential wind turbine sites with wind speed analysis uh, that's been on the government website since 2010. Why do we need another comprehensive report costing millions perhaps you could ask the guest tomorrow we'll put that on there uh, ready for tomorrow john thanks for that interestingly it doesn't identify iristain as a potential site times change don't they julian's on now hi julian hi andy how you doing very well thanks you have a good weekend yeah not too bad yeah just uh, interesting looking at uh, what you might say alternative news um I'd like to talk about the huge farming protests across Europe that don't seem to be making the headlines on British media. Like Interesting, the that, isn't it? I mean, I, I watch a lot of uh, foreign news channels, uh, and particularly, I'd always recommend watching Euronews, and it is all over Euronews. They've been making a complete, well, literally a stink in Brussels and obviously in Paris as well. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, they've been using uh, banners that read, no farmers, no food. Um, you've got tens of thousands of farmers uh, currently protesting in Belgium, Germany, France, Poland, Italy, Portugal, Greece and Romania. And this morning, Slovakia is joining in following a statement from the Slovak Chamber of Agriculture and Food stating the reason as, and I'll quote them directly, the EU's green fanaticism is to blame. Um, outside the EU headquarters, as you've probably seen in Brussels, 1,300 tractors have been jamming the entire road network, whilst 30,000 farmers are pouring manure onto the EU headquarters entrance. Similar happenings in Paris, Lisbon, Athens, Rome, Bucharest and others. Um, and meanwhile, farmers have also been blockading European ports like Zeebrugge in hopes of stopping cheap, less certif- certificated foodstuffs from around the world, undermining heavily legislated EU farmers. Um, Time magazine reported yesterday that the recent EU announcement of imposing far stricter green farming policies has ignited the pan-European protests. And of course, we've heard some of these reasons being they want to reduce fertilizer usage by 30 percent. In Belgium, tractors have been exempt from high diesel duty as they are mostly used off road. And the new green rules would remove that exemption. Across the Netherlands, the Green Initiative uh, demands a huge reduction in nitrogen emissions. And on top of all this, Ukraine, who don't have the same stringent green uh, food certification process, have recently been allowed to freely export their grain to the EU at much lower prices, which have undermined EU farmers, uh, coming straight after uh, the Ukraine receiving billions in aid. Um, What with other farmers' subsidies being reduced, 
but then you've got this ever more stringent green legislation. Um, you could almost think that the farming system has been set up to fail uh, by bureaucrats who have no farming knowledge at all. I mean, it um, may ha- be perhaps that obviously uh, Europe is, um, and certainly the EU is predicated on proportional representation. Uh, you know, the voting system is PR. Consequently, the green lobby and green politicians get, uh, you know, um, get into Parliament where that's concerned. Certainly in Germany they do as well, because Germany is all about coalitions. And the Green Party have uh, made their way far further into European politics than they've ever done in Manx politics or certainly in British politics. But that's down to the voting system, Julian. Well, that's right. But you know, something that's skewing this a bit more. I don't know if you saw it a little while ago. There was what you might call a negative beef propaganda program uh, on Channel 4, which was called the Big British Beef Battle, uh, presented by Ade Adepitan. Um, and he was attempting to convince British Northerners to give up beef to stop climate change and climate impact. Um, and he was shouting down a megaphone in a cafe, attempting to guilt trip people into changing their uh, beef eating behaviour. But one of the problems that's highlighted with that programme is that it was only citing the global emission figures, but it completely fails to address the fact that, for example, if we take the UK and Ireland, the topography and weather here is perfectly suited to growing grass, which doesn't need fertilisers and irrigation. And when you've got hills and slopes, actually the UK, 65% of the UK is only suitable for cattle and sheep. As you know, combine harvesters don't do too well on a or one in three gradient, for example. Um, But that program, he cited global CO2 emission figures of 99 kilos of CO2 emitted per kilo of beef. But if you actually go to the proper UK source, which is the UK Agriculture and Horticulture Development Board, the average UK figure is less than a quarter of the global figure at 23.4, not nearly 100. And the lowest emitting UK farms were down at 5.6 kilos, which is the same as olive oil production. So and which, you can't get a... I mean, this all comes yeah. back to battering each other with figures, doesn't it? Uh, of, of sort of yeah. bandying figures around. And I'll just contend uh, that, that the person in the street, the person who has got many more things to do other than, uh, you know, concentrate daily on climate change, this passes them by. This completely yes, goes over people's heads and they just hear people arguing. True, but take Howell and Allen on the programme last week with Lamara. They were both absolutely correct. You know, CO2 is the food of, of food of life. You know, it's the gas of life. You know, without it, we're, we're knackered. And, you know, it actually was on a downward trajectory before the Industrial Revolution. But it got much lower. Well, there wouldn't be any plants or only the um, a certain type. But, you know, the vast majority of plants were getting smaller and smaller. And that's been done experiments. Um, but when you're looking at figures like this, you know, if, if, if a Channel 4 program is saying that the emission from beef is terrible because it's 99 kilos, but there are some farms in the UK producing 5.6, that's a heck of a, of a drop in it. And, you know, these figures, that 99 kilos is skewed and inflated because it's also including places like Brazil that have been trying to repurpose forests cutting them down, trying to turn them into grassland, which not only causes massive deforestation, but then you also requires constant irrigation and fertilisation that we don't use. Uh, You've also got animal welfare regulation is nowhere near what we've got. And they're also feeding those animals, not nice natural grass, but things like soya. Um, And because of that lack of regulation, 2% of the UK's imports of beef are from Brazil. So they're kind of lumping us in, a bit like saying that the Isle of Man is the number three polluter in the world, which is an absolutely ridiculous statement, as Alan correctly stated. So coming back to to the Isle of Man, we have a fairly small agricultural sector on the Isle of Man. What should we we be doing about it? Well, let's put it this way. Remember I said the other day, I did look it up, actually. It's about 100 kilos of herring is the allowance for the Isle of Man. Do you know what the allowance, what the actual amount that the Shetlands did? And they've only got a quarter of our population. What, you know how many tons of herring they did last year? No, how many? 84,000 tons. 
So we've got pot, so, we've got the pot potential to grow. Let's put it that way. Absolutely. I mean, you know, that's 840 times what we're allowed in a population that's a quarter of our size. And, you know, there's there's no and, you know, this, it, it, it just doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. You know, who's going to get into fishing when the government are getting in the way by telling you you can only have one 840th of what you might be able to collect? I mean, even back in um, even back in the old days, you know, um, that figure from 1956 in the Arleman Examiner, that was 1.2 million fish that were taken um, in one day on the Isle of Man. And now it's 100 tonnes for the whole of the season. I mean, it, it just doesn't make any sense. So you will be uh, expecting DEFA to be, if you like, getting things moving to create a, a bigger catch, a, a bigger potential catch, and also igniting the industry, as it were. Yeah, and also, you know, fight for the island. We're, we're pretty hilly here. It's a lot of grass. We don't need all of the usual stuff to, to grow cattle like other jurisdictions do. Let's have a proper audit and just see. And, you know, don't forget, when they start going on about cows emitting methane, you know, a cow's ruminant stomach is digesting cellulose, a bit like um, bison did in the old days. And there were millions of those around the place, um, which is known as the biogenic carbon cycle. And, you know, grass is constantly growing. So the CO2 in the grass is being eaten by the cattle. This is not locked up, sequestered carbon that's buried in limestone, which, by the way, is in concrete, which is used for wind turbines. Um, So that CO2 that's coming out the ground all the time in the form of grass eaten by the cattle, they eat it. Their stomachs then turn it into methane, which then breaks down again over some years back into CO2, which is then used up by plants and grass again. So there's that natural cycle that's been going on for millions of years. So it's almost like they're trying to panic us into all this when it's just, you know, the Isle of Man, I would hazard a guess at the moment, even though we're at a smaller um, scale, is way lower than what their tr- like Channel 4's programmes try to make out that our, our emissions are from, from beef cattle. We're probably one of the lowest in the world. I, w- I would ima- imagine that we're probably down in the five or six kilo things like olive oil production. OK. All right. Thanks, Julian. Good to hear from you. Thanks, Andy. Cheers. All right. It's 18 minutes past 12 on Manx Radio. Um, thanks also. Oh, just talking about untaxed cars last week. Uh, John just said uh, the untaxed car, if it was a UK registered, it wouldn't have a tax disc. Uh, that's true because they don't have tax disc anymore, do they? We were talking about untaxed cars being left on domestic roads and on residential roads and also large vehicles being left and some just being used as storage facilities. Uh, The cracked concrete on Douglas Promenade, do we now just accept it? Nothing has been said about this. Thank you, says Joe on 927. Uh, Douglas Promenade doesn't look shiny and new, (laughs) does it, at the moment? It doesn't really. Uh, Garth commissioners are wasting £4,000 on a contract cleaner to clean the public areas instead of using the staff that they already employ. It's madness. We've had uh, this case over the past few days when all the rates have been announced, the new rateable values and what have you, and it's fair to say that they haven't gone down. Only one has stayed the same, but every uh, everything else has um, uh, also gone up. So, hey-ho, um, the RSPB is more credible than some people on bird strikes, uh, says uh, 554. We get to opinions, we get to figures, we get to numbers. Whenever we talk about uh, climate change, climate effects, climate crisis, whatever you want to do, everybody has an opinion. I just stress this, of course, is a public access program. This is all about opinion. You may hear somebody uh, with whose opinion you differ. By all means, you are more than welcome to come on and counter it. Thanks also to uh, um, uh, a message uh, regarding, and this was regarding, oh, it was the weekend, wasn't it? Thank you. And this was uh, a note in from Brenda. Hiya, Brenda, who just said, I would like to complain. I was on uh, Castle Street in Douglas at the weekend. It was on Sunday afternoon when the shops were open and I was just happily walking down Castle Street when a grown man on a bike drove straight in front of me. 
Uh, I must have said something, (laughs) says Brenda, because he turned round and looked at me uh, a bit angrily. And I just said, you're not allowed to cycle down here. Basically, says Brenda, I couldn't repeat what he said to me, but it was along the lines of, you don't know what you're talking about, go away. I consider that rude and bullying. He was a grown man in a purple jumpsuit, I think you mean lycra, in a purple jumpsuit on a very expensive bicycle, and it was on Duke Street, uh, sorry, Castle Street in Douglas. It was... uh, not pleasant other people witnessed it and i thought it was illegal to cycle in castle street it is illegal it's against there's a bylaw against that and douglas council were talking about uh, everybody being nice to one another and i'm sure that the vast majority of cyclists wouldn't condone that sort of behavior and i'm sure the vast majority of cyclists wouldn't cycle down somewhere which it is illegal to cycle down a pedestrianized precinct But some cyclists do. Some cyclists continue to cycle on pavements. Continue to cycle on pedestrianised precincts. And then look gone out when people point out the facts of life to them. I'm sure you're not one of those cyclists. If you are indeed a cyclist, I'm sure you don't like that sort of behaviour. Because nobody wants to be tarred with that sort of brush. But quite simply, what do pedestrians do if you're confronted by somebody who is breaking the law? Do you point it out to them? Do you look at them sideways? Or do you just kind of look the other way and get bullied into submission? Text, email, call and WhatsApp uh, and also the pouring of manure on EU officers is nothing new. We've had the same thing on the Isle of Man. Where was it? Oh, I see. It's manure that's spoken. Francis, you're joking, aren't you? 762. (laughs) Thank you, Frank, as well. Uh, There are insect factories up and ready to go so that we can eat insects instead of meat, says Des. They talk about this. Where are they? I, I, listening to um, uh, the chief minister regarding housing, says Texter 802, though he hasn't addressed the huge numbers of empty homes. We live in central Douglas, and there must be 20 houses within a very short distance of us that are empty and have been for years. So we shouldn't be building new houses without addressing the issue. Perhaps you could ask the chief minister and Douglas Borough Council. <laughs> We urgently need an empty property tax to encourage houses to be lived in. Also, listening to the business uh, regarding rate increases, what happened to the all-island rates reform consultation that started in 2015? Food for thought. Thank you, Texter802. I don't know whether you recall, but ahead of the 2021 general election, one of the main topics... First of all, one was green issues. Everybody was green. Housing was there too. One of the main topics people wanted to be addressed by incoming politicians. So when Alfred Cannon, MHK, Chief Minister first laid out his island plan on being elected Chief Minister, housing was listed as one of his top priorities. Housing. Halfway through this administration now, does the Chief Minister feel enough is being done to tackle the housing crisis? The Chief Minister. We are already declared last year that, that we are proactively assessing now the creation of a housing association to free perhaps the tackling of, of some of these housing issues up and, and releasing them from sort of direct government control and creating a more fluid and flexible body that will be able to react, I guess, more proactively to some of these challenges. And of course, you know, we no- also need to make sure that we are properly supporting the local authorities, which we do regularly in terms terms of the financing and loans that they need to get on and also tackle it. So look, there's still a lot to do in, in this area. I'm a little bit nervous about this word crisis. I, I would say, you know, the housing challenges definitely. I mean, I absolutely accept there are challenges. I accept that cost of housing is, is a concern. But we are taking a lot of steps 
to make sure that there is adequate housing on this island and that people have opportunities to get on the housing ladder. And as I say, you know, there's still quite a lot of work to be done, but as but I've already evidence that we are making substantial progress towards alleviating some of those burdens. Do you feel like that progress is quick enough? Well, it's never, it's never <laughs> quick enough. Look, we're never, I, I don't think anywhere is ever going to build enough social housing, for example, to, 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 to satisfy absolute demand. But we make sure we've got the right blend of offering and that we are continuing to progress. So, for example, you know, not only are we building all these houses in the private sector, and of course, a proportion of those are designed them for first time buyers. Uh, not only are we progressing with projects like the nurses' home project, you know, but we're also now increasing capacity further with the island infrastructure scheme that will see three critical brownfield sites developed. And I'm keen to make sure that government's coordination around its strategic asset base is also as refined as it possibly can be so that we're not holding on to sites any longer than we need to and I think there's clearly some room for improvement in that area so there's there's a lot to do it's a major major piece of work for us and we're delivering it's helping benefit the economy we're building more houses for people but still more is needed. The Chief Minister talking about the housing well he didn't he again he he shrinks away from the he said he was nervous about the word crisis um is it now he, he talked about the the big brownfield site projects that are coming ahead uh, ocean castle them is a part of tevere wants to transform a uh, spaldrick promenade in port erin they want to put up um, apartments there it's a privately held investment group established in 2017, building here, there and everywhere. Tavir are, and also remember uh, the island infrastructure scheme re- redeveloping those three key, key brownfield sites supported by private sector investment of 50 odd million. So 55 apartments on Lake Road in Douglas by Tesco uh, being developed by uh, Duluth Limited, part of Dandara. There's the Lock Promenade, the former Villiers Hotel site, which is being developed as well, again by Tavir. 80,000 square feet of commercial retail and leisure space and a high-quality public realm. An 80-bed hotel there as well. In terms of housing, if you know somebody, if there's somebody in your family circle of friends that is desperate to get their own house but is stuck in rental accommodation what do you say to them do you just say it's a shame isn't it a pity everybody struggles to get on the housing ladder do you say well stop buying five pound cups of coffee cut out your satellite television rentals save some money get your deposit together what do you do What words of comfort do you give somebody who simply cannot get on the housing ladder? Is it always meant to be a struggle? Or do you think it's government's role to ease their way into the housing market? Creating, you know, the government mortgage. Giving some help. Buy to let. So what do we do? And also rent to buy. If you've got any thoughts on this, if you can sort this whole uh, issue out between now and one o'clock, we'd really appreciate it because uh, we, the government don't seem to be getting anywhere with it. I mentioned tomorrow Lizzie Riley and Paul Evans and Ian Ramsbottom are on there. From, well, uh, Paul and Ian from Wardell Armstrong, the wind farm consultants to Manx Utilities. Lizzie Riley's from Manx Utilities. And we're talking about the new wind farms that um, which at the moment looks like it's going to be the south of the Isle of Man, Erie Stain ties into all sorts of things really what we you know how much money is it going to save us will it save us any money in the end will it be as green as we think it's going to be Thanks also to Eddie, who dropped a note in and just said, you mentioned that Hillside Dental Practice is opening. When's it opening? Today. Monday the 5th of February, uh, Hillside Dental Practice is operating. Uh, By the way, any appointments that have previously been booked in advance by Regent Dental Care have been cancelled. So if you have uh, an appointment at Hillside, you haven't any more. Uh, 
This is allowing the prioritisation of exams for children and patients who haven't been seen for a long time. Uh, they don't want you to call, by the way. <clears throat> They're delivering emergency appointments for Hillside patients who will be treated for presenting problems only at the time. Uh, if you have any pain, bleeding, swelling, contact the practice on an emergency appointment basis only, 642-389. That's 642-389. But uh, Hillside Dental Practice is back operating today. Get the full story. Tune in to Manx Radio's newscast for in-depth interviews behind the headlines. Find the newscast now at manxradio.com or your usual podcast provider. No matter how much you need to dig or how much you want to dump, Fox Group Isle of Man offer an extensive range of plant hire, long-term lease and sales. We're the island's exclusive supplier for Louis Gong excavators with immediate delivery. Our machinery comes with a complete service package with finance plan options. Call John on 458946 to discuss your plant needs. Fox Group Isle of Man, part of the Fox Group of companies. I began to struggle with the stairs, but I didn't want to leave our family home. So my daughter told me about Acorn Stair Lifts and their new showroom in Douglas. I was able to try the stair lifts and find the right one for me and the home I love. They were so friendly. The whole process was hassle-free and they offered the whole package from installation to servicing. Choose the island's first choice for stair lifts. Acorn Stair Lift, South Quay, Douglas. Call Acorn Stair Lifts now on 672 414 or call into our Douglas showroom. I love to drive. Drive smarter. Drive more reliable. Drive a great deal at Man in Motors. With a superb range of cars for every budget always available. And if we don't have it, we'll source it. Plus, servicing, valeting and prestige detailing too. Man in Motors. Richmond Hill, Douglas. Find us on Facebook or call 420 420. That's 420 420. Drive a better bargain at Man in Motors. Located in Upper Douglas, Woodburn House offers an elegant, one-of-a-kind space to host your unforgettable event. Celebrate your love story and say I do to Woodburn House. Our 2024 wedding diary is now open and our wedding planner is here to take care of every element of your perfect day and make your dream wedding a reality. Woodburn House. Visit woodburnhouse.im or call 888300. That's 888300. The Canon administration has had bold ambition to radically change the government and the prospects for our economic future. But halfway through this government's term in office, what meaningful change can they point to? Is the Canon government's ambition one you share or are there aspects of it that you are not signed up to? On agenda this evening at 6pm on Max Radio, political commentator Alistair Ramsey joins me, Phil Gorn, to pick through the policies and ponder what meaningful change will be delivered. Are we witnessing a bold revolution or some deck chair rearrangement to get a better view of the iceberg. The Man in Line with Andy Wint. Pastor by, it's uh, 26 minutes before one, this Monday lunchtime live from Douglas in the Isle of Man. Uh, Every Monday and Friday, we're looking back over 60 years of Manx Radio. Manx Radio came on air in May 1964. There is no other radio station in the British Isles that is actually older than Manx Radio. They've all changed names. They've all become other things. But Manx Radio started in May 1964. And we've got a big archive, and today we're back in 1981, 43 years ago, looking at the death of the TT legend Mike Halewood. That's after Man in Line finishes today. Uh, thanks also to, uh, oh, another Brenda. Hi, Brenda, who just said that she'd left a message on my phone last week about the installation of smart meters on the Isle of Man. Did anybody watch that Channel 5 program last Wednesday on smart Smart meters. Should you get a smart meter? Did anybody see that? What do you think about it? Walking along, says text of 557, walking along the inner harbour in Castle Town, the railings of Castle are still unpainted, as are the railings at Paulson Park. Uh, sure, surely a coat of paint is not beyond the DOI or whoever's responsible. Port Erin's railings are painted regularly, says John on 557. Man Government, says Marie on 7 five aren't interested in productive farming they'd rather pay farmers per acreage and the mnfu and the majority of land of island farmers are happy
happy to pick up the payments for very little effort. Look at the grey, barren fields, says Marie. Thanks also to uh, 554. You can't graze cows on high ground, but you can graze sheep. Thanks also to uh, Sharon. If your listeners really want to know, you should be watching GB News on <laughs> Sky 512. I saw Kevin Woodford on GB News a few weeks ago. He reviews the, the news on that. Thanks also to uh, 068. Uh, this uh, Climate change is a natural cycle that the planet's gone through for thousands of years. We happen to be going through a warming cycle, 068. Uh, how can wind turbines be green if you're going to dig up half a mountain to install them? Well, we're getting to opinion again, 068. Uh, that's why cyclists need to wear some form of identification at the moment. They can do what they like and get away with it. This is talking about Brenda being nearly mown down by a, a cyclist on Castle Street in Douglas over the weekend. Is it time for cyclists to have identification and perhaps have some sort of insurance? But quite what you do, I mean, when people behave in a bullying kind of couldn't care less fashion, all cyclists surely know you do not cycle in a pedestrian area. Even people who aren't familiar with the customs of the Isle of Man surely would notice if there were no cyclists in a pedestrianised area, you shouldn't be cycling there. However, the examples proliferate. If somebody does cycle and another cyclist sees them, they think it's OK to do. And if the law, if the bylaws aren't being enforced by Douglas City Council, then who is responsible? Is it the people who are breaking the laws or the people who aren't enforcing the laws and just telling everybody to be nice to one another? Garth commissioners need to look at the state of the public shelter on Laxey Promenade. It's disgusting. It's unkempt. It's dirty. It's a mess. It hasn't been cleaned for months. And the public loos on the quayside stink to high heaven. You smell them long before you open the door. What was once a lovely, clean village looks like Steptoe's Yard. Well, not all over, Fran Francis Frankie, 762. But the public loos on the quayside. Well, do your own research. Uh, did you see the documentary about Summerland? I think it's shocking, says Sue. Uh, Mr. Cannon came along across as insincere. I think something should be done uh, to have the misadventure verdict overturned and those responsible for bending the rules made to pay. Thank you, Sue, for that uh, opinion. Again, the whole Summerland thing, 50 years on now, 50 years on. Do you think it's something we should just let lie now? It was a completely different era. I mean, if we, if you were talking about something 50 years previously when that happened, you'd be talking about the 1920s. Is it something that we... I mean, in the end, what needs to come out of the whole Summerland issue? Do you think it's just something we should leave and look back as a, a tragic mistake? Tragic, if you like, concatenation of circumstance that just happened? An accident? Uh, thanks also to 313. Mr Cannon lords his setting up of the Housing Committee, but two years in, at the moment, just another organisation. And 762, did you know postmen cycle on pavements? I didn't know po post postmen and women still had cycles, that's true. There's one that cycles down the pavement on Parliament Street every morning on his way to drop the bag off at the post office. I am right, aren't I? It is illegal to cycle on a pavement. You're not allowed to do that. You should cycle on the road. Regarding housing, Ed in Ramsey, walk down any of the high streets in any of our towns and look up. Most space ab above the shops is empty. They need investment to bring them back into use. I realise not everybody wants to live above the shop or even right in the centre of towns, but surely it may be a help. Thank you, Ed in Ramsey. Well, it has to be said, that was a big pitch 20-odd years ago all over the UK. It was called City Centre Living, and it worked an absolute treat. They got people, particularly young people, living back in city and town centres. 
It's an idea. What do you think should happen? Alan's on now. Hi, Alan. Good afternoon, Andy. Uh, I've, I've rung up, really, to talk a little bit about uh, the wind turbines. I'm not, not around tomorrow. Otherwise, I would have uh, tried to get uh, to talk to you uh, then. I used to live in Cornwall. I came over to the Isle of Man about two and a half years ago. The village I lived in was within one and a half miles of a whole set of very, very large wind turbines. So just to give a little bit of uh, anecdotal uh, information as to what it's like living around wind turbines. And what is it like? Well, it's, it's not as bad as people... You know, the picture people who seem to be painting on the island. Uh, I walk there pretty much daily with uh, my dog, and I was never ever aware of any bird carcasses or anything, you know, actually on the ground or anything. There was bird life. They, the birds did stay away from it, and they seem to uh, be, you know, they seem to know. But uh, there was danger, and so, uh, as I say, you didn't see lots of uh, carcasses or anything there. And the other thing that uh, of note was that uh, the farmers on whose land the wind turbines were put, uh, they were still growing in their crops, and there were still animals feeding. So, again, the, you know, the bits about uh, poisons elements coming off the wind turbines well i'm not sure that's uh, correct how many wind turbines were there uh probably about uh, eight or nine of the very large ones uh for anybody who knows cornwall it was just off the a30 uh the village was called st newland east and the wind turbines were placed on an area called uh, Newlyn Downs. Do you were you there? We did you live there before they built them? Uh, no, there were always some there. What what they did was they upgraded them. Uh, they went from smaller ones to much larger ones. You know, to the sort of size that uh, they're talking about putting on the island now. Uh, did you regard them as, um, I mean, were they detrimental to the view? Did you, you know, did you in any way resent them, Alan? Uh, you got used to them. And, you know, again, some of the things I've heard about people being put off uh, coming to the island. Uh, well, there's no shortage of visitors in Cornwall. If anything, it's the other way around. There's too many. Okay, and so in terms of... So can you just say categorically, all the times you walked your dog around them, did you ever come across the carcass of a dead bird? No, no, never. But and then... Uh, how many years did you walk your dog around them? Uh, probably ten years. Okay, all right. All right, we appreciate that, Alan. Thanks for calling today. Okay, well, as I say, it's all anecdotal, so there's no uh, scientific facts with it. I can only uh, report as I saw. And your opinion is as valid as everybody else's, Alan. Okay, but I don't like uh, the solar panels. That's the things I didn't like. Okay. All right, thanks, Alan. Here's Anne. Bye. All right, 16 minutes before one. There is no housing crisis, says Texter 068. We have 6,000 empty properties here. Population that hasn't really changed in a decade. We've got falling school numbers. There is no housing crisis. So, um, so what's the problem? 068. I've got a solution to rude cyclists who break the law by cycling on pavements. It's called giving them stick. You said take a stick of a reasonable length and throw it into the spokes of the front wheel. Right. (laughs) Thank you, Mikey. I'm not suggesting you do that. We're trying to find a way through this. And again, it comes down to the tiny minority of bullying, badly behaved cyclists who insist on cycling on pavements you know they're the ones that you see everybody else sees they see you looking but they pretend they haven't seen you and off they toddle but everybody's seen them so if you are one of those cyclists who do happen to cycle periodically on a pavement or a pedestrianized precinct please don't think you're invisible 
everybody sees you. Andy Wint, the nation station, makes radio. The Ginger Hall has it all. Check out the new restaurant, now open at the Ginger Hall Hotel, where you'll find a fantastic range of food, from classic winter warmer bistro-style dishes to delicious Sunday specials and great celebration meals. Don't delay. Book now on 897231. Or visit our Facebook page for all our opening times, pictures and full menus. You'll even find details on our live music and more. The Ginger Hall really does have it all. Housing, benefits or employment issues, faulty goods, bad workmanship, financial problems and relationship breakdowns. We all run into difficulties in life and it can feel like there's no one who can help you sort them out. But at Manx Citizens Advice Service, we can help. As an independent charity, we offer free, confidential support covering all sorts of areas. You don't need an appointment. Just call in at Promenade Church, Lock Promenade Douglas, or call 366-338. Open Tuesdays from 12.30 till 3 and Fridays 10 till 12.30. Manx Citizens Advice Service. Your advice service. Everyone's more conscious of energy usage nowadays. So Manx Utilities has begun installing smart meters for standard domestic customers island-wide. With our smart living app available too, you'll be in control of tracking and managing your energy. No need to contact us. We'll be in touch when we're ready to fit your smart meter. Visit the Smarter Living page at manxutilities.in. Manx Utilities, delivering a smarter future. Journey to a Dream, the podcast that takes you behind the handlebars of motorcycle racing's ultimate challenge, Roads on the Isle of Man. I didn't realise normal people could race motorbikes. I thought it was something on TV or for superheroes. From the thrill of the speed to the allure of the island's mystique, join me, Beth Espy, as we unravel the passion that drives these riders to push the limits. Childhood dream, you know, it's something I've always wanted from since being a kid. Journey to a Dream, available now at manxradio.com or your usual podcast provider the man in line with andy wint uh thanks also to uh, 964 domain road isn't a brownfield site how much have they paid for other commercial sites so they can build the block of flats on domain road if they get keep spending all the reserves we'll be in a crisis oh dear thank you 964 um, thanks also to they want to, to get us used to eating insects so people who eat them in Africa will feel at home on the Isle of Man says Des I think you're adding two and two and making 17 there Des but never mind it's never been easy at, regarding housing says 557 I'm sure uh, parents had to work hard and save uh, as stated they wouldn't have had the luxury of the latest iPhone also um uh, smart TV and car and things like that, says John. However, if more and more people are getting trapped in rental accommodation and aren't getting onto the property ladder and consequently don't feel they have a stake in the Isle of Man and in the, the property world, what do you do about that? Particularly young families, people who've got perhaps two wages coming in and it's too much for social housing and they can't quite get a deposit together to buy their own house. So they're going to be stuck in rented accommodation for years, decades possibly. What do you say to them? If it's something, if they want to get on the housing ladder and partake of the wealth of the Isle of Man, but they're being prevented from getting onto the housing ladder simply because they can't get the wherewithal together because it's being swallowed up in big rents. Now, what do you say? Do you just say, oh, well, tough luck, too much, never mind, isn't it a pity? Or do we do something about it? Thanks also, uh, 828, thank you. Affordable housing with a 12% rate rise for most of us is a big chunk of our income. If government were so intent on spending our money on consultations for this and that and actually made some decisions themselves, which they were voted in to do, we may not actually be facing this hidden tax, which for most of us may be well over £100. That's a weekly shop at the very least. The problem could be that ministers don't actually know enough about their departments and therefore need a consultant. 
Thank you. Good to hear from you. 828. Um, I don't know whether... We, I know this was mentioned last week. Do you think we should actually start calling rates a tax instead of rates? Do you think it's time to call it really what it is? A property tax? Oh, Julian's back. Hi, Julian. Reply uh, to the previous caller. Uh, the, that wind farm he's referring to was upgraded in 2020, but they are only 40 metre diameter. The Erie Stain ones will be three times the size. Oh, crikey. So 40 metres, to get the um, yields we're looking at here, are going to be at least 110 to 130 metres across, and, of course, consequently, much taller. Um, so that is something that has to be borne in mind. And, of course, the bigger the turbines, the lower the frequency, a bit like a wind instrument. So those... Um, infrasound oscillations that resonate like a drum on people's houses won't be an issue with the smaller turbines in Cornwall. So the the ones in the our 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 ones will be what did you say three times as big? Yes. The ones at Cornwall off the A30 uh, are 40 meters. Uh, this is part of Centrica's new innovation program. Um, so they are significantly smaller even though they're fairly new. Um, I think they had problems trying to get the huge ones up. They're near Carlin Cross on the A30. Um, so, yeah, there's, it's not really... A, I mean, you know, imagine... that uh, He's saying they're large. Well, what three times that going to be described as enormous, gigantic? Yeah, we'll be well. We'll, we'll, we'll tomorrow. Out. That's what perhaps one question we'll put to them is, why are that? Why is this particular size of wind turbine being considered and no other size? Exactly. By the way, I did watch that um, smart meter program. A um, couple of takeaways were he seemed quite dismissive of things like data security, especially when uh, a chap was showing him people that were harvesting people's user data, go, go God knows where. So, of course, you can infer when people aren't at home and criminals might be quite interested in that while you're at work or, you know, you're out shopping and you have a certain pattern. But one thing that it was not addressed was what's called demand side response in the UK. And that's where certain circuits can be remotely turned down or switched off like you're charging your car. And that feature to me kind of infers that the future plans for energy generation. I mean, we're in 2024 now, but it almost infers that we're going backwards in the in the handling of people's requirement for electricity. In if what way? Tur- well, if they can turn you down manually with a smart because it's not just a meter. This thing gives the, um, the MUA two-way control over your house. Not over all of it, because legally they have to keep you going in terms of light and cooking. But if you have, say, a car charging circuit, that one will be connected to the smart meter, which can be controlled on a screen in pull rows manually from there, remotely. So if they start to find, you know, we're, we're struggling a bit with, like, you know, a thousand people all charging their cars overnight, they can just turn them down or they can turn them off remotely. That was not addressed, and that's a level of control that people aren't being told about. OK, all and right. Thank, up, yeah. Good to hear from you, Jim. Thanks for that. Why isn't there a scheme, says 802, to help older residents to downsize from homes that are too big for them? That would allow properties to be released so families can move to larger properties. There needs to be a scheme for both ends of the property ladder. Not everyone wants to live in an apartment. Maybe we need to address the number of second homes and holiday homes. Good to hear from you. Thanks for that. So we're with Wardell Armstrong on Manx Utilities on Wind Farms tomorrow. Thanks to Chris Quirk on the phones. W-I-N-T. 60 years serving you as the nation station. This is Manx Radio. There are moments over the years when a piece of news shocks the whole island. Summerland, the death of David Jeffries, the Winter Hill disaster. On March 23rd, 1981, came news that Stanley Michael Bailey Halewood, Mike Halewood, had died. He was driving his kids to get fish and chips, and his car was hit by a lorry. The whole Manx nation mourned. A cold, damp morning in March 1981, Hunt, Taveri, Surtees, Agostini, Duke. The stars of motorsport gather to show their respect and grief 
for one of motorcycle racing's all-time legends, Mike Halewood. Just three years earlier, Mike, aged 39, had confirmed, if it was ever needed, that he would become a legend by performing one of the greatest comebacks of all time in the 1978 Isle of Man TT races, his 13th win. Mike summed up his feelings at the time. Well, through all the laps and every lap, every corner, they were all cheering and waving programs, and it was just fantastic. And going through one of the parts of the course, a place called Ramsey, which is very slow, I could actually hear the people cheering in the, by the side of the road, which was just amazing. To win a TT race at any time is an achievement. To win on a different machine after being away for some 11 years is almost unbelievable. His performance, in particular around the TT course, was, was absolutely outstanding. Uh, the most memorable, of course, was after a long period uh, of virtual retirement. He came back in 1978 uh, on the Ducati and uh, absolutely annihilated the opposition. Mike enjoyed life. He enjoyed having fun. And as Mike's own home movie shots show, that humor became infectious. But Mike did have a serious side. Mike's widow, Pauline. Before a race, uh, in the morning, we'd never really sort of talk that much. You know, it was a race day. He wanted to concentrate on what he was going to do. Uh, he didn't usually sort of fool around that much on race days before a race. Plenty after the race, but not before a race. <laughs> Part of Island Life for 60 years. This is your Manx Radio.